I want to say some things about this past day. We've been spending time with Jonathan Stalls, who's the founder of Walk to Connect, and it's been really lovely. Yesterday, some of us were trained on how to be walk leaders and uh, getting our community outside and connecting. And today, we went on a walk at 6 o'clock this morning, and it was beautiful, and beautiful things happened while we were walking. And so the idea of bringing Jonathan here for our community came out of a grant that we got <clears throat> from Colorado Health Foundation. And the idea is that we start a walk program to get people outside, get connected to each other. And uh, so John, no, no, nothing more to say except that Jonathan's lovely and I'm so glad he's here. So thank you. Thank you just for coming out and just for this invitation to be here. This is such an exciting topic uh, for me. And obviously by the title, and I've met a lot of you already, which is awesome. And this is something that by the, by the frame of people and places at two to three miles per hour, this is, how, this is how we've been wired to see the world. This is how we've been wired to connect to ourselves. This is how we've been wired to connect with each other. In fact, um, uh, someone from yesterday's training uh, reminded me, and I'm always reminded of this, that most of the world moves this way pretty comfortably. In fact, they do it without even thinking that it's something they should be doing. It's something that they're already doing. And this is really a, um, a unique intersection that we face here in the US around how do we prioritize our most inherent form of transportation? How do we learn from what we used to really be doing not that long ago? In fact, in the 19, 1890s and the early 1920s, there's all kinds of writings about how people are stressed because they don't feel comfortable with the horse and carriage passing them on the street because they can't comfortably walk a round trip, 10 mile uh, walkabout to their downtown or store area. So we have a lot of room to invite that type of invitation here in Alamosa um, and also just across the country. So I'm excited for, I'm just excited to be here. This is, this is us at 6 a.m. this morning walking around town. Um, we had about 20 people come out this morning, which was really nice. And it, it, show, it, it, it feels simple to a lot of, to, to how we come to this conversation of walking, to how we come to the conversation of being a pedestrian, we all have different reasons for coming to it. And when we think about um, when we're actually out moving, it's something that is really hard to just talk about. You have to feel it. You almost, you have to be in your body, moving with people and moving through your neighborhood to understand it, to really understand the benefits. Um, as an example for this morning, we connected with each other. I, I intentionally had people walking with people that they didn't know. I saw people running across the street to hug a neighbor or a friend that they didn't see before. Someone's laughing in the back. I, s I felt people meeting each other for the first time, and I felt this genuine connection happening for an hour and a half this morning. This can be happening every single day in all hours of the day. And how do we prioritize the invitation for that? So I want to first just talk a little bit about me, my story, my background, and why this is something really interesting, and this has become a passion uh, for me. In 2010, um, on March 1st, I decided to leave the Delaware coast and walk for eight and a half months across the country. And this is when I was 26. And to decide to do something like that was, was, a, big, it was a big decision, right? Eight and a half months, 14 states, hundreds of towns, thousands of people. To do something like this, I wasn't a hiker, I wasn't a backpacker, I had no experience getting outside and exploring things this way. And so, when I was wrestling with how do I feel connected to my own community, how do I feel connected to myself, how do I feel connected to risk in my own person, you know, I, I often heard the term rite of passage and I never felt that I had that experience as a young man. I grew up mostly in suburbia, all over the US. I moved every two years of my life, and I felt pretty disconnected. I felt pretty isolated. And I know 
that that's actually a story that's only getting louder across the country for how isolated, how disconnected we're starting to feel. And so for me, this was, this was full of risk. And the big question that I, that I always asked myself was, do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes to be strong? Do I have what it takes to be capable? Do I have what it takes to, to conquer something like this where I have no idea where I'm gonna sleep every single night? I have no idea what the horizon and the landscape is gonna look like for the next day. Through Colorado and over the Rockies, through the high desert of Utah, Nevada. I also wanted to raise awareness for an organization to, to get kind of, you know, just to get out of my own head and out of my own goals and to, oh, sorry, that's okay. You're fine. You're fine. Um, and so I raised awareness for an organization called Kiva. And Kiva is a micro, a micro lending organization that helps support small businesses through micro loans. So for as little as $25, you, me, and 10 other people can support this organization and an entrepreneur of your choice. So someone might be starting a small business in rural Central America, or might be starting a small business in rural Africa, and you, me, and 10 other people all give $25 to this business owner, and in a matter of months, they pay you back. And you can recycle that $25 for years to help people. It was a model of social business and empowerment, saying that you have what it takes to pay us back um, in ways that I didn't see a lot of nonprofits or social businesses doing. And so I sent them a big proposal saying, hey, I'm thinking of walking across the country, and it's going to take me maybe a year. And, thousands of miles and I put together this brand and a proposal. I'm a graphic designer communications major in my, um, in my college experience and the marketing director called me right away and said, um, and said, oh my gosh, this is really exciting. Absolutely, let's figure this out. So we generated a partnership and on March 1st I started off walking and my, the title of my walk was called Kiva Walk. And so throughout the course of the, of, the, of the walking experience, we were able to generate over half a million in loans for entrepreneurs all over the world. So it was an amazing partnership, and it was really something that brought me into all kinds of conversations and events and meeting a lot of local people as I went across. So as I was mentioning before, the fear in the unknown of stepping outside of your house and your normal patterns to just walk, to just go. I mean, it's almost as saying, if all of us had backpacks on and we just decided to leave this, this door out here and go for two weeks, what kind of questions would come up? If the 10 of us said, you know what, let's just do it. Let's just go for two weeks. What are we gonna, what, are, what, what kind of questions come up right away when you think about doing that? You know, it's obviously, I don't have the time. Where are we gonna sleep? What kind of, what kind of food are we gonna eat? Safety, career, weather, rain, tornadoes, feet, nighttime desert snakes, mountain lions that attack you. I've seen your signs here in Alamosa. <laughs> yeah. um, so the, it, it, there's tons of risk and there's tons of things that say no to that kind of choice, to that kind of mission, to that level of behavior. And I think we've gotten so far from trusting our instinct, from, from moving right into fear as a learning opportunity and as a present choice that, okay, I'm gonna tackle this. I'm gonna be stronger for it. How do we move into the unknown and practice what the unknown can show us and teach us? And I feel like walking is one of the most foundational, and I learned this on this trip, one of the most foundational ways for the body to participate in those two things, literally. So this was my route. I had no idea what I was doing. This was all risk. It was all, I, 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 was, <laughs> I was literally, when my friends dropped me off on the beach, I was by myself with my dog and we started walking west. So you'll notice here, Delaware coast, 14 states, took, me, took us three days to walk across Delaware. So if you want to do a state, start with Delaware. It's great. It's just good for the confidence. It's good for <laughs> a lot of things. And then walked along the Potomac River up the CNO Canal Path just south of DC along Maryland, and then a little bit through Pennsylvania and West Virginia, all the way across Ohio. <laughs> it was a long walk across Ohio, but it was wonderful. Through southern Indiana, southern Illinois, um, into St. Louis, and then along the Katy Trail, along all the way across Missouri, following the Missouri River, and really connecting with Lewis and Clark and their history and then moving into Kansas City, and then generally following the Highway 50 corridor in Kansas. 
after moving through Kansas, coming in um, around Pueblo and into southern Colorado, and then generally following Highway 50, so through Salida, Gunnison, and then into um, Montrose and all over Utah, did a big winding route through Utah, um, and then into the high desert of Nevada, which was um, by far and away one of the most amazing places. Lonely Highway 50 in Nevada. I can't even begin. Rolling hills, 12 mountain ranges, up and over a range in a couple days. Sleeping in the middle of these valleys. As far as the eye can see, nothing man-made. Hardly a car. Wild horses in the distance. It was unbelievable. And then moving into Carson City, up and over the Sierra Nevadas before winter, and into San Francisco, California. So, why walk? And we've talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but this is... You know, I, I really wanted to connect with a sense of knowing. Like, I wanted to know my own body. I wanted to know the land that I was walking on. I didn't want to drive past it. I didn't want to do, I didn't want to base my understanding of Earth, my understanding of people, uh, based off of 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. I wanted something foundational to teach me the intimate details of the human experience. And it felt like walking was really the only way, the only invitation into that. I wanted to know my country. I wanted to have my understanding of someone's history, a country's history, a state's history, war history, political history, religious history, and so on and so forth, from the context of walking and meeting people and not just reading books or seeing updates or following social media. I wanted an intimate experience with my own country so that I could speak to it from that place. And I wanted real people connected to the things I've just mentioned to stay with and get to know and learn from and take on all kinds of stories to help inform how beautiful across the board American people are. So what I learned Obviously, um, connections to place. I can't, I, I can't even begin how many to understand. When someone says Ohio, I know Ohio. When someone says West Virginia, I know West Virginia. I know Colorado, my home state, in, in, such, a, in such a better way. The soul of Nevada. So many people say, how did you get through Nevada? Or how did you get through Kansas? And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. But do you know Kansas? Like, do you know the hospitality and the way the sun sets behind the fields? And, the slowness that most of the families I stayed with, the unhurried uh, conversations over dinner. I, it, it, there was something about Kansas that, that, that stuck, and I know it. I know the spirit of these places. And storms, and the changing of seasons, something that prepares you for the unknown, prepares you for change. When you are a drop, your, your, your fragile body is moving underneath a potential tornado within a 10 or 15 mile distance, you have quick conversations of fragility and making sure that you're good with how things have been resolved. And you have to sit in that. And I was able to do that and have, and to come on the other side of it and to come through days of hard rain and to just feel connected and to ultimately welcome the changes of season and temperature. And obviously walking with others, walked with hundreds of people, thousands, for an hour, two hours, half a day, all day, weeks at a time. The things that happened with other people informed so much in me with what I've given my life to with my work. And it was to, to see within hours, sometimes within just 20 minutes, the same levels of connection and whole health, as we call it with Walk to Connect, the same things happen to every single person, no matter age, no matter background, no matter you go on and on and on, within an hour they'd be like, oh my God, I feel so, I feel so relaxed. I feel so connected. I've never noticed this before. I've, oh man, the, the stress that I was feeling this morning is just, it's, it's sitting in a different place. I'm, I'm just, I just feel more natural in terms of how I'm connecting with me, this perfect stranger, and the area where we're walking. I've never walked this road. Why would I never walk this road? Well, typically because it's a small highway, run, cars are running 50 miles an hour, but the fact that we were doing it together changed, changed the whole thing for them. And I had families who dropped off their, um, their homeschool kids often. So families would say, hey, what are you doing today? Uh, I've got some things to run. Can I just drop my kids off with you? 
for the day. <laughs> and I'd be like, sure. And so the kids would join me for a day and it was a learning experience and, and it was incredible. So obviously something that happens all the time when doing things like this is the spontaneous. So I could go on, I have stories after story after story with this, with this experience, but this was an amazing person who had a dream of walking across the country at one point. He stopped me on our tracks. My cousin was with me. This is near the Red Canyon along the Colorado River in, um, uh, in Utah. And he, he and his wife were so sweet. And they said, well, we went to the store and we're coming back and we just didn't know what to get you. And so we, we decided that a, a two gallon jug of grape juice is what you needed. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. Can we just sit down on the side of the road and drink grape juice together? Because there is no way I'm carrying this thing, right? So we sit on the side of the road and we're just chugging grape juice because we don't want to leave a lot with him and we're trying to discern, is this going to make us sick? We have a lot of walking left. But we're having this amazing conversation. In a matter of 30 minutes to an hour, he and his wife invite us over for the next day because it was going to take us a day and a half to get to where he lived. And they invited us over for dinner and to stay the night at their house. So we go to his house the next day and we have dinner, but first we walk into the house and the house is just covered in bird poop because they have 30 to 50 exotic par parrots flying around the entire house. So you walk in and these birds are just everywhere. And my cousin had long hair like I'm wearing right now. And there's, there were three hair diving birds that landed on his shoulder immediately and started twisting their feet in his hair and diving in all directions because it's, it's how they clean their feathers. Fascinating. You'd have no idea on the outside. 30 to 50 birds. So we're eating a, a steak dinner while the birds are flying around. It was, it was amazing. Um, all kinds of things happened. People helped us out along the way, offered free food, offered massages, offered, offered, offered. People felt connected to us because we were moving through. It's a story of trail angels that you will hear over and over and over again when people do things like this. It just completely reignited my trust in how good people are and how good we are and how that message is not, it's not projected enough. We're not hearing it. Our kids aren't hearing it. Our kids aren't seeing it that we are good in a lot of ways, and we have the capacity for great hospitality across 14 states. There was nothing short of that with everyone I met. Obviously, this is an example of just different meetings and gatherings and things that we would do. Um, I could go on and on, hundreds of stories of people that I connected with. Um, I do have to share this one story. This is, uh, this is Camp Grandma, and this is in the middle of rural Illinois. And so this is another example of just the spontaneous, being open, moving at an unhurried pace so that you have the time to get to know people like this that are doing things like this. I heard about Grandma a couple towns before, and they were like, oh, you've got to visit Grandma. You've got to visit Grandma. I'm like, all right, awesome. And they just say, when you get to the town, just go to the library or anywhere and ask where's Grandma's house. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> So I did, and they pointed me to Grandma's house. And she knew she had gotten a call from, the, from someone in the town previous that I was coming by. And so I get to Grandma's house, and she walks out of the trailer, and she's, just, she's a carpenter, so she's got really just calloused hands, and she's ripping the counter out of this trailer, and she's just amazing. She comes running out. She's like, oh, hey, you're here. Great. I'm going to, and she yells for her grandson Levi, Levi, come on out, take Jonathan back to the, back to the farm, back to grandma, Camp Grandma. And so Levi comes out, grandkid has a lizard on his shoulder, and he's just walking out, and he takes me back, and we're walking through the fields, and then she yells at us, oh, take, stop him by the mule farm, too. So she's got a little mule farm, we walk by the mule farm, and we're going through the fields, and in the distance, there's this eight-acre protected forest just shooting up out of the, out of the agricultural field. And we get to the gate, and right on this gate says Camp Grandma, Parents by Permission. And underneath that sign is a little box that says, all cell phone, all electronics required to go in here before entering Camp Grandma. But the Parents by Permission is perfect. So I walk into the Camp Grandma, and no joke, there are 15 to 20 young kids running around the place, climbing trees. Grandma built. She literally dug up two man-made ponds, built a cabin, has a little campfire. The cabin has, has bunk beds. It's, the fridge is stocked with s'mores. And she's got this whole experience protected for the, the neighborhood grandkids. 
And so there's three entrances to the eight acre plot. And so kids just come in and out and they know the rules. Parents know the rules. And these kids are just running around, digging in the mud, climbing trees, hanging out. They, they've been taught how to run the fire. They're doing everything. And to just see this happen in what she's created, if she can do something like this, you know, what can we be doing to tell, to tell a story that's needed for how we connect to nature and how we get rid of just the default screen connection and how are we doing things like what she's doing? So other, more host families, more stories, um, and obviously connecting with myself. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, there's a lot of group walking, there were a lot of people that walked, but you can imagine miles and miles and miles of just solo long days in Kansas, long days in Nevada, long days in Colorado. And when, we're, when, when, when I moved this way, it was the, the clarity, the groundedness, the contentment. I always tell people that just, just two hours from your front door, just consider taking a two hour walk from your front door and have your spouse or a friend pick you up if you need to in two hours. And just, just see what that's like and notice your, your, your mind space and your heart space and your spirit and where it's at from where you started and when you finished. It's amazing what moving this way, especially for days, weeks, and months at a time, does to your spirit. So, 242 days, right? So that was in 2010. And I literally finished uh, in San Francisco. I had about 150 people that walked, that, that met me at the beach, and about 30 host families flew out from all over the country to finish. It was, and surprised me. I mean, it was one of the most touching, amazing, uh, it, 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 it just landed so deep inside that this form of connection is so important to the human experience and to obviously to my experience. And I really walked away knowing that I had what it takes. I had what it takes to face risk. I had what it takes to face the unknown and to do a lot of things with my life. So it was a really important journey for me. And so what now? So soon after, um, soon after you can imagine after finishing a walk like that, it was really difficult to transition you know, back into a normal way of doing things. And so I had some transition time. And within that transition time, my father and I walked the, uh, the El Camino de Santiago. Um, he had, he completely doubted my walking experience from the beginning. Oh, he's just talking. That's not, he's not really going to do that. And then about a month or two in, he was like really paying attention. And he joined me for a couple days at a time. And he became um, just addicted to the idea of having a journey like this for himself. And so we committed to do the 490 mile Francis route, which is the red route you see across Spain, which is the main or most popular route across Spain. It's an old pilgrim path that's been a walking path across Spain since 800 AD. And people from all over the world, 250 to 300,000 a year do it. So this was an amazing experience to not only connect with people from all over the world, but to see what it would be like if an entire corridor was protected and built and maintained for the pedestrian, for the walking experience. It was an amazing affirmation for what we what we could envision here in the US for how we think about connecting to our towns and our villages and to each other. So that's a picture of him, and that's uh, finishing at the, at the coast. So, so obviously thinking about you know, you finishing this, this really long walking adventure and having all of these perspectives shifted and having all of this, this experiential knowledge of what life was like at three miles per hour across the United States and what life was like across Spain and what brought so many people on a, on a, on a yearly basis into great places of healing and connection. And then coming back home and seeing how challenging that is to activate that level of behavior here in front of our own doors, in front of our own main streets, in front of our own highways, and the way that we've started to build things out in the US. So I started, I thought that the best way to start was just start taking people out, give people permission to just get out. I was telling folks at the training yesterday that I started out with uh, putting flyers up for walks that were for 28 miles on a Saturday. <laughs> and nobody signed up. Uh, 
But I eventually figured it out and started inviting people into smaller experiences that would take them. But not just take them on trails, take them on roads that are connecting us to the grocery store. Take them on roads connecting us to Main Street. Take them on roads that aren't necessarily always inviting the safe, curated, marked trail or path so that they can experience the, the benefit, maybe the option of doing it on their own in the future, but also the challenges for how we need to think through potentially protecting this experience. So I started taking folks on walks, and then as I continued to take people out on walks, I was realizing, and, then I, and this is obviously one of the things I learned from the, uh, this is one of the things I learned from the cross-country walk, was not only the opportunity for connection and whole health, but literally the most stressful times on this experience were obviously on roadways and, am and amongst traffic, to, to daily be against 30, 50, 60 miles an hour, every single day, constantly. And you feel it in small ways when you're maybe walking along Main Street for a long time, or if you're at all ever out on 285 and you happen to be walking on it, you, you can immediately feel the difference. Your, your, your entire person shifts to a different energy level. You have to really work hard to separate and think about how you're connected to the earth, but really this is taking over how you feel connected. And so, I really recognize that there's not enough invitation for us to be activating where we're defaulting and how we build our streets and how we build our communities, how we think about land use, how we think about highways, how we think about connectivity from where we put people and where we put the village and the destinations. Um, so it was really clear, embedded experientially throughout this walk that this was something that needed more attention and how do I bring how do I bring the combination of pure people connection, human scale connection, into the reality of how our built environment or how walkable community design is creating big barriers for us to do that safely and easily? This is an example of what we just see all over the US, all over. We've just so quickly taken how we're built to move and replaced it with something like this. So it really feels like a crisis when you're out walking in this environment all the time. And on that same note, how do we invite ourselves and others who have the choice to drive into the experience of those who don't have the choice? Because they're experiencing this every day to get to work, to get to where they need to go. So there's a lot of intersection for how are we intentional about educating and connecting um, to, to the built environment, but obviously with whatever we have, prioritizing the benefits that come from moving this way. So that's what founded Walk to Connect. And Walk to Connect is, um, it's been around for four years, and this is a, um, it's a walking cooperative, so it's a walking co-op. And we're based in Denver, and we're serving communities all over Colorado. Um, our mission is creating whole health outcomes through connection-focused walking program. So, it really is about connection. We're not defaulting to calories and Fitbits. It's a part of it, but we're maximizing the whole health story, the whole health invitation of this is mind, body, spirit. It's all a part of how we connect to each other. So how do, we, how do I get creative to make this invitation available? So obviously, talking through the whole health piece, mental, emotional, communal, spiritual, environmental, physical, when we think about mental health, I think this is really important. I like to repeat this often, is that when we're, when we're moving, it's built-in EMDR treatment. If you're familiar with EMDR, it's a form of treatment that activates stress and trauma slowly, almost like a drip system. And as you're moving, when you're literally, your eyes are scanning your environment and your, your bilateral movement activates these thoughts that we store in places of stress, to slowly cross through central brain. So it's a built-in mechanism for healing. And I don't, know that, I don't know that we know that. I don't know that we connect to it enough because often we're not moving this way enough to, to, really, to really tangibly feel the benefit of that. And then obviously the connection piece. How do we maximize the connection to others? I can't even begin to, to share the opportunity and the need for this, especially when we think about our kids, when we think about how they're trusting, when we think about the big looming question of trust. Do I trust this person who's different? 
looks different, their background's different, their economic situation's different, their, you, you could go down the list. And when we think of difference and we think of however we come to that, how do we even connect to it? How are we modeling how we connect to difference? And I can't even begin, story after story, walk after walk, when we have people that are on both sides of the political aisle, both all sides of religious belief systems, all sides of race, all sides of income, when we have people moving shoulder to shoulder, alongside, activating, physiologically activating, alongside behavior, it does something to our wiring. It, it, it shows us that, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, this per they're talking about their, their daughter and their family and where they're from and their vocal inflection is similar to how I might describe that passion and, and they're, they're, they're talking maybe about something that was difficult and hard and stressful and wow, I've had places of pain that are similar to those places of pain. It happens all the time, all the time on our walks. And it is a natural way for us to invite back into our algorithm of understanding people, to invite back human scale connection, human scale shared experience. It doesn't mean that we all need to agree by the end of the walk, but what it means is that we're inviting our kids and inviting ourselves to participate in a different way of getting to know other, a different way of getting to know each other. And to me, in today's climate, this is, uh, I think this is one of the best things we can do for our body to show up in action towards a vision of being more communal, more together, more shared decision making, shared community building. So this is something I want to, I want to, I, I like to hammer in that walking with others activates this in ways that, um, that we're just, we're not doing it enough in this country. Um, the people we love. So I often talk about how, you know, how we could be connecting more with our people in our families, our kids, our spouse, family members that we might even be in disagreement with. If you're in an argument and you're having a fight or if something really good is happening and you want to celebrate it in a different way, to take it out on a walk. Often folks will say, walk it out. But moving this way, even just in our own commitments to our family and our own personal life, to, to get away from the default of sitting down and having kind of the, the confrontational across the table, but to take our significant other or someone that we care for and to move them under our true ceiling outside where, the, where, where things are more open, things are more natural, we're typically going to approach the person we love from a more natural and open place. This, this also goes for colleagues, work environments. You know, we've so quickly defaulted to doing transa transactional meetings under the context of interiors and sitting down. How do we change that? So obviously thinking about connections to, to the places we live. How do we intimately experience the challenges of getting to practical destinations, getting to the things that are in our midst? We talked about that earlier. And sometimes just having people stand in the median for a little bit to feel it. And obviously connecting to ourselves and the many benefits that come from that. So we have all kinds of events all over the state. We have a calendar of things going on all the time, and we develop what we call walking movement leaders. This is just a snapshot of some of the communities that we've started to activate and support. Um, you'll notice Caminos del Valle at the bottom, which is the one here in Alamosa that we just started. And so really this is about supporting leaders, and it's activating and inviting what we call whole health walking movement leaders into how they become the invitation for more activity like this in their community, in their own personal life, in their family, and so on and so forth. So we've got over, over 4,000 people engaged, um, 50 plus walks a week all over the state, had 877 walks in 2015. So it's cool to see how things are growing. It's been fun to see the invitation spread um, throughout the stories that we're telling. So our walking movement leaders get we, we invite them to get creative, to combine their unique skills and interests into the kind of walks that they want to lead. Because this is, this is mostly volunteer. So how do they become activated, whether it's local food connections, whether it's mothers, first time mothers, whether it's connecting to the earth, whether it's, it, there's a lot of different invitations and how do we make the leaders feel supported in how they want to do it. 
art, um, older adults, um, having adults play on playgrounds with kids, why not? We need more of that, we need more play. And so giving permission to have walking experiences that invite play for the adult as well. Um, working, we do a lot of walking programs with local refugees and just different immigrant groups that are in Colorado. And so how do they feel more connected to everyday neighbors and culture as they integrate? And so we do different things related to that. Big New Year celebrations and different events that happen throughout the year. Um, taking youth out, always thinking about ways to take high school students out and college students. Um, this is uh, your partner community in San Luis. So we've had a, we have a smaller relationship with a group in San Luis through the clinic. And they've been leading a weekly walk for about a year now. And they get eight to 15, mostly mothers, out every evening. It's every Thursday evening, I believe, um, in San Luis. And as you can see, all seasons. So it's been fun to see the connections they've been making through this. Obviously, art walks. This was up in Yampa Valley, um, Steamboat Springs. We have a lot of long distance, 15, 20 mile hikes and different things, multi-day experiences. Um, always thinking about ways to include diverse populations, um, inclusiveness at a level that invites literally, you know, really thinking about what is the invitation for people with disability into things like this. So it's not just walking, it's rolling and strolling as well and, and moving at one to three miles per hour together. And so we can understand what they go through. Creating maps. Um, taking our city council members and different public officials, people that are decision makers, on routes that show them the challenges in their neighborhood, the challenges um, and the opportunities in what they're hoping for and how can they connect to it better. Um, we do walking festivals, um, thinking about destinations from neighborhoods. Um, we're a part of a lot of different things nationally with the National Walking Movement out of DC getting creative with alleys and how can we put paint in alleys as invitations for people to walk. And then right from our front door. So how are we as individuals thinking about committing ourselves to more walking practice or more of a walking behavior to understand what's right outside our front door? We have maps that encourage people to draw a circle that's a one mile radius around where you live and commit to walking everywhere in that circle. So if you have to make a trip, 10, 15 minute walk that you commit to walking. And for bikes, they have a two mile radius that they'll typically do. So as an example, Monday, I was in Alamosa and I decided to make sure that I'm, I'm putting myself to that test. So I left from State Street. This was Main Street and State. And I walked and I decided, you know, I looked on the map and I see a rec center that's all the way on the south side. And for a recreation center, I'm really curious what what the invitation's like for people to be activating physical health, mental health, emotional health, to connect to an obvious destination that would only support more of that behavior and connection. And so I started moving. This was a four and a half mile round trip, one hour and 30 minutes, and I made sure I stopped by all the parks that were in the area too, because I wanted to connect to the local parks on the south side. And so this was my route. And as I'm moving along, you can imagine that, you know, and this is the story all over the US, all over, has street poles in the middle of where people might be trying to get around, um, uneven sidewalks. Nobody has perfect sidewalks on every single street, but it is a story that's important to tell, and it's important for us to know it and experience it. So you can imagine, you know, the curbs that, that you've got the diet, you've got the cross, um, sidewalks but no ramps to go down to get to the garden. Um, you know, you have maybe a ramp on one side but then it dead ends into a curb with grass on the other. Um, but then you've got things like this. You've got great programs that you're in partnership with to bring valuable assets to the community with parks and bike lanes. And this was great to see. We don't see enough of this where in what would typically just continue to be gravel, you've got an investment that was made to put a sidewalk in right on the east side of the street as people are traveling by foot or on bike potentially um, to get to Main Street. So we keep going and it's funny, interesting, right here is when I actually talked with a young girl who was walking from the recreation center back to her house. And so I had a great conversation and she just shared, yeah, it's not the best. I don't feel all that safe, but I have my music in and I feel like that helps me. And she does that trip a couple times a week. And so it was really good because I couldn't, it was, she had her workout gear on. I couldn't imagine another location where she might be going. And it was, it was fun. She was probably about 17. And so then this is, you know, you have the corrections facility on one side and then you keep going. 
and then thinking about the ball fields and then moving into the rec center itself. And so what's great is you do have a little opening on the fence. Often there's not even an opening, so you have to crawl over the fence or you have to walk all the way around. So there is some consideration for this possibly being a behavior for a pedestrian. So you can scoot through there and then scoot through there and then you're at the rec center. Um, there are no sidewalks around the rec center, so you get in and you have to kind of, it really is car dependent for getting there. So it's not, I'm not necessarily trying to point things out in this way, like this is what should be fixed, but from an awareness standpoint, if we were walking more, we would feel it. We would know it. We'd know how to speak to it whenever it came up. We would be showing up in the meetings when the planning was happening to make sure that there was access to the neighborhood that's right next to it. If we built in connectivity to this type of conversation. So continuing on, um, same story with some of the things that are going in in the area. Just you drive right in, you park and you leave. No, there's just not really a thought for how people might get there in other ways. And then thinking through obviously 285 and the challenges that, that exist is that as that is a corridor potentially for how people get by. I saw two people on bike on the frontage road of 285 getting to Boys and Girls Club. And so they were having to wait and they were darting across 285 on their bike as cars were coming around that corner. So things like that, you can sense what people are generally having to kind of work through to get to the destination. So different intersections, different things, and then coming through, loving the parks, but loving the bike lanes. Zapata Park was awesome just to see some of the new things that have gone on there. Um, great uh, ramp, diagonal ramps here for getting into the park. So you can tell there's some really good things happening too. So what can we do? So thinking through, thinking through um, how, do we, how do we begin activating this behavior in a way that doesn't demand just built environment and sidewalks, because it's so much bigger than that. How are we getting back full circle to the human scale connection of doing the best we can with what we have and prioritizing how we bring our kids and our, and our, and our families and our communities into this level of connection. So what's really exciting is that we've launched um, Camino del Valle, which is the meetup group with this, well, I'm sorry, it's the walking community. And what I'm showing you here is the meetup group that we started, which is one tool that we're using to create invitation around how people can sign up and connect to the events. This is one of many things. It's really clear that it need, we're mostly focusing on flyering and how are we getting the word out outside of online, res online sources. But it's, you can tell how leaders could start developing farm walk Thursday night at six o'clock. Mothers, mothers and daughters or first mothers every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Um, Lucia, who is one of, one of your amazing new leaders, has an idea for pre called Preserving Our Earth. And I'm putting her on the spot because I'm sharing this. <laughs> I hope she doesn't mind. But she has an amazing passion for deeply, deeply inviting people into the connection of how we respect Mother Earth, how we take the time to kneel almost at the feet of the soil and of the tree and to appreciate that to the level of, and her example was, how do we encourage kids and people to go out on maybe a monthly walk bring trash bags and go out and pick up trash together while walking in the community. And you could see so many things attached to that invitation that she would add to that experience. Uh, to have, and I think in our training yesterday there were about five, of five leaders that were intentionally describing that being a priority for how we connect people, that we're bringing them into nature, bringing them into um, the farms that are happening at Rio Grande Farm Park, that we're connecting them tangibly through walking to nature and to Mother Earth. That could live on, on, all, of these, um, on all of these promotional tools. And it really is an hour, maybe a two hour a week or a month volunteer role of leading people on these different routes. So these are some shots from our walk this morning at 6 a.m. It was an amazing um, hour and a half, and it was just a perfect example of what happens on specifically during these invitations. People showed up and right away saying, wow, I don't know everybody. I don't know this person. I don't know half the people. I, and you could tell there were all these connections being made right away. Um, pretty quickly on, I, I encouraged people to connect with and walk with someone they didn't know. So you heard all of this chatter, getting to know neighbors and people that had just moved here or people that had been here for 12 centuries, or 12, not 12 centuries, for 12 generations. Um, that, wait, you, you do this or you're connected here, this is what you, so that happens 
act, I mean, to activate that in an hour and a half in a natural setting while getting exercise, dot, 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 and all the benefits that come from that. And at 6 a.m., it is beautiful here at 6 a.m. We got a couple head nods for future 6 a.m. walks, but only a couple. <laughs> Others were like, oh, I don't think so, but maybe 6.30. Spontaneous, one of the walkers said, hey, I'd love to invite everyone into my garden, right? So it was a block away, wasn't too far off the route. Most of the people didn't know the route anyway because they were so engrossed in their conversation. And we all of a sudden started walking into someone's backyard. And now we're connecting with all the hard work that he, he puts in to his, his incredible habitat yard. This yard draws in bees and butterflies and birds from all over into what he's created. And so he was so proud and happy to have 25 people barging in on the back of his yard. Kids, strollers, all of it. So again, and kids, when they're with us, they're experiencing these connections. They're experiencing strangers in a different way. They're connecting and they're moving to their own community in really good ways. And obviously local art and the different invitations that come from when we're passing by things, we just have a greater appreciation. I remember pulling away when we were walking by this and there were three people that had stopped to really look at the art. And it was almost as if they just had never taken the time to do it before. And you could sense it. And so again, activating these types of invitations on a weekly, monthly, um, even daily basis can do some really great things. So I talked a little bit about some of the new leaders. This was a picture from our training yesterday and some of the thoughts that came out of that training. Um, and then just activating the streets that maybe aren't always trails, but how are we helping each other cross streets and tell stories about how can we make our town, our crossings, our experiences pedestrian safer, more enjoyable, more comfortable. So as, as a takeaway here, I just want to, um, encourage you to sign up. There's a sign up sheet over there if you haven't yet uh, for the Caminos de Valle walking group. There'll be emails and things coming out um, you know, in a couple weeks here. Grow your own personal connection to whole health walking that you commit to that two hour walk from right where you live. I, I can't even begin to tell you. Two hours. Take photos. Be open to the spontaneous and who you might meet along the way and share that story with others so that they are invited to do the same and simplifying and slowing down. That we, if we're trying to get somewhere um, to a certain destination, that we don't necessarily need to park right in front of the entryway. That maybe we park 15 minutes away, a mile away, and we walk in so that we're unhurried and that we're grounded and that we're more connected with what surrounds wherever our meeting is. Embracing the unknown, getting creative, and enjoying the process. So I'm, thank you. This is awesome to be here with you all. And the partners that are a part of this program make this possible. It allows us to bring resources and just support as you start your walks, as you get things activated. Um, there's a lot of good things coming. And we have a lot of leaders who've done a lot of good things all year long that are going to be supporting this community, um, not just me. So we're going to start bringing other people into the fold through phone calls and visits. And uh, we're just excited to be alongside how you all um, connect. And I just have to personally uh, thank you for, to Alamosa and all the work that you've already done to create such a beautiful place. I've spent already hours on your levee and on the river and I have deeply appreciated all times of day in what you've protected here. So just some deep gratitude for all the time you've put into that. And stay connected. So thank you.